Hi, Jeffrey. Hey, Bob. How you doing? Great. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing about average, but uh, I'll call it good. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available in both streaming video and via audio podcast. You are Jeffrey Miller, professor of psychology at the University of New Mexico, the author of a number of books. Let me read some titles. The Mating Mind, How Sexual Choice Shaped the Evolution of Human Nature. That's one. Spent. Sex, Evolution, and Consumer Behavior. That's a 2009 book. And then one you co-authored with, with uh, Tucker Max. Is that his name? Yeah, that's right. Um, it's called Mate, Become the Man Women Want. Now, that is the book that I needed, oh, 40 years ago. Um, I needed it, too. Yeah. And, and even now, if you want to just kind of give me the upshot, it would probably. Who knows? You never know. What kind of advice you're going to need. One thing we're going to talk about today is polyamory. Am I even pronouncing it right? Yeah, good enough. Polyamory. Polyamory. You are a champion of polyamory. And as I understand, I mean, polyamory is for people who want to be uh, sexually involved with more than one person at once. I don't mean necessarily at the same moment, but, you know, in ongoing sexual relationships with more than one person at once under conditions of complete transparency. So they're not deceiving yeah. anyone. They're not cheating. And now, is it true that, uh, such as your devotion to polyamory, that your Twitter handle is actually a reference to it or not? Your, your Twitter handle is primal poly, P-O-L-Y. Um, it's a little bit of a cryptic Twitter handle. So primal poly, yeah, it originally was about polyamory, but it also kind of, Hints at issues like polygenic scores and polymorphism and poly this and poly that. Um, even even there's a subtle hint to kind of neurodiversity. But yeah, I kind of picked it because I was intending to write a book about kind of the evolutionary psychology of polyamory. Mm -hmm. And I thought I might as well build a, a Twitter handle that reflects that. Why not? Yeah, and you are uh, from the evolutionary psychology tradition. Um, which is one thing I want to get into because I think there are people in Ev Psych who might be surprised to hear um, somebody from Ev Psych championing polyamory for the fo for the following reason. I don't know if you've ever gotten this, but of course, evolutionary psychologists believe that there are significant differences in sexual psychology between men and women. Uh, they think that jealousy it has some basis in the genes and that uh, actually jealousy is an example of an asymmetry between men and women uh the nature of it and um and the sense uh, is that th that you often hear is that these these things kind of complicate uh the prospects for um things like well well the standard anecdote is is to say that, well, those naive hippies in the 60s started communes and thought that free love would work. It didn't. Everyone got jealous. That's because they didn't understand evolutionary psychology, right? You've, you've heard this, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. So I think there's a dumb way to do polyamory, and there's a smart way to do polyamory. And the dumb way is to take a blank slate view of human nature, to argue that jealousy is a social construct that is easily deprogrammed, um, to argue that there are no sex differences between men and women, et cetera, et cetera. And that, to be fair, represents kind of the vast majority of people who identify as polyamorous because they tend to be kind of far lefty. They tend to be um, pretty skeptical about evolutionary psychology often. Mm -hmm. I think the smart way to do polyamory is to say, look, jealousy is real. It's an adaptive emotion. It served important functions in prehistory. There are sex differences in how it's expressed. Men tend to get more obsessed with, you know, sexual jealousy and who, who exactly is copulating with my female mates. Women tend to get more um, concerned about emotional jealousy, or maybe a better term is resource jealousy. Like, um, you know, if I have a male mate, where is he devoting his time, energy, attention, resources, meat, etc.? Right. Well, it's so I think. I th I mean, I think just, those, just to drill down on that for a second. So, so in movies, a common line is you hear the man saying, don't worry, she didn't mean a thing to me. In other words, I had sex with her, but she didn't mean a thing to me. And the idea that, you know, the reason you hear men more than women say that in movies is that 
the woman uh, more than the man is concerned with emotional infidelity. In other words, the man actually falling in love with a woman, although both both things are threatening to both, both sexual jealousy and, emo and you know, fear of, of sexual infidelity and emotional infidelity are concerns for both men and women, right? It's yeah, a question absolutely. of relative importance. So I think the key point I would make really about jealousy is like when I actually taught a course on polyamory and open sexuality to undergrads here a couple of years ago, and we read a lot of evolutionary psychology, including the literature on jealousy. Um, we read a lot of the empirical research on different kinds of open relationships. And there's not enough research yet. It's a very understudied field. Um, but a lot of what we discussed is, you know, evolutionary psychologists like David Buss or Steven Pinker would be totally willing to admit aggression or homicide or propensities for violence are evolved adaptations. They are instincts, but we learn to control them, right? Civilization is kind of one long process of learning to reduce aggression and violence and homicide. And we've reduced it by at least two or three orders of magnitude. So it, I think it stands to reason that you could potentially do that with other emotions, including jealousy. And I think there's a weird kind of double standard where, you know, I've, I've had discussions with David Boss and with other EVSI colleagues who I respect a lot, and I point this out, but they still tend to have the reaction that, yeah, but man, jealousy is different. There's something special about jealousy as an emotion that makes it uniquely hard to overcome. Hmm. I mean, that's interesting. I, I guess in terms of the other emotions, I mean, I guess I'd say what's observed is that the behavioral manifestations of things like rage and hatred uh, have been reduced in certain circumstances. Um, that's not the same as saying the emotions per se have been overcome. I mean, I guess to some extent the, the, their control over the behavior has been reduced, but you understand kind of the distinction. I'm, I, I mean, I guess what I'd say is that um, one way that, uh, that violence has been reduced is, re is, is by reducing the circumstances in which the emotions would naturally arise and the violence would arise. So, for example, the state controlling uh, violence through a justice system. You, you, you know you don't have to retaliate. You can just call the police. Whereas with polyamory, it's almost like far from reducing the circumstances in which the, the problem arises, you want to increase the circumstances, right? Yeah, I guess... There's different ways to manage these these troublesome emotions, right? Um, state control, state monopolies on on violence is one way to reduce, you know, retaliations and cycles of violence and feuds and all of that. Um, but on the other hand, if you take the internal game seriously, of uh, you know, you did a whole book on why Buddhism is true and how advantageous it is to be mindful mm -hmm. of our evolutionary instincts and emotions, and to be able to kind of put them in brackets, hold them at arm's length, not necessarily take them too seriously. And I think um, the people I know who do polyamory well tend to meditate. They tend to take mindfulness Is that right? seriously. Yeah. And um, if you didn't do that, if you didn't have those sort of internal resources for managing these feelings, then yeah, you'd, you'd kind of be um, tossed around by whatever whimsical, you know, reactions you might have to my lover doing this or my secondary lover doing that. So I think the combination of having a kind of meditative and, and mindful approach to these emotions, number two, having evolutionary psychology insights into why they're around and what functions they served, you know, and why some of those functions might not be relevant anymore. Yeah. Um, I think those can help a lot. Well, I think it's certainly true that through mindfulness meditation, you can loosen the grip that various feelings have on you. So it is something I'd recommend to somebody trying to do this. I, I had not thought about the possibility that a lot of polyamorists, if that's the noun, are actually meditators. I'm not sure this is what the Buddha had in mind, but on the other hand, <laughs> it's whatever. Well, I mean, yeah, if you go to Burning Man, right, 
Burning Man is a, is a very mindful oriented culture. Everybody there meditates and does yoga and so forth. And also polyamory is kind of the, the tacit mating system of Burning Man. Like they don't publicize it. They don't talk about it, but that's kind of what you expect. If you go there is a bunch of people who are trying pretty hard to do ethical non-monogamy. Um, and it, the key thing though is, you know, it works for some people, but there's no good reason to expect it to work for everybody. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not one of these sort of poly um, advocates who goes around saying monogamy is bullshit, marriage is bullshit, everybody should be poly, everybody could handle it. I really don't believe that. I think in the current culture, it's, it's going to be kind of a minority uh, mating style until we get the kind of cultural supports for it that – that help people do it better. Yeah, I mean, that's one question I was going to ask is like, why make a movement of it? I mean, I, I mean, you know, it's like, if it's working for you, fine, but it's not as if you're really a persecuted minority. It's not like you go for a job interview and, and the guy says, now tell me, are you sleeping with more than one person under conditions of complete transparency? And that's going to like work against you particularly, right? I mean, so, so it's kind of, I mean, you guys have a flag, right? There's a polyamory flag. Yeah. I'm not saying you have one. I don't see one in your office right now. I'm no, I don't, kind of I don't have with, one. What's that? I, have, I don't have one. I have lots of others, other shit behind me. Okay, but I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad. glad. But but you take the, the, the question, and, and I guess your answer is, well, for you, it's not so much a crusade. I mean, I have heard you, you know, I think I've seen you in a position of, I don't know if advocacy is the right word, or just maybe defense of the lifestyle as an alternative. But But there is the question of, like, why make a movement of it, right? I think there is a serious stigma problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't necessarily get asked in a job interview, are you polyamorous? Because most people don't know enough about it to ask. But you can get in situations where, because it's not a protected minority status, it's not like being a particular race or religion or sexual orientation. It's not a legally protected status. So you could potentially get fired depending on where you work, for having consensual, ethical, non-monogamous relationships. In family court, you could lose child custody. Um, there's a lot of social shaming. So, for example, if you're like me, you're kind of poly, but you're also one foot in the kind of libertarian, conservative movement. Um, the people who are in that movement tend to be quite monogamist right? And quite intolerant of polyamory, which they typically don't understand very well. And so I get a lot of flack from those folks um, on the basis of, of kind of, you know, really frequent misunderstandings that are totally forgivable, given the poly is pretty new. Um, but there is pretty heavy social stigma. And some of the empirical research on poly shows it's much more heavily stigmatized, actually, than being gay or lesbian or a particular race or a particular re religion. Like, it's, it's really not a very popular thing in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. I mean, for most people, you'd have to explain to them what it is before you could ask them how they feel about it, right? I mean, I, I, I would, yeah. do you have any idea what the name recognition for the, the, the word polyamory is? I think it... it it, there's a real cohort effect. Like people under 30, I think probably about half of them have a pretty good idea. Mm -hmm. Like I teach human sexuality to about 100 undergrads per semester. And I actually run polls in class. And I would say, yeah, about a third to a half of them sort of know what poly is pretty well. Mm -hmm. People over 50 typically don't. They, they think uh, it's just some bullshit excuse for cheating or it's no different from hippie free love stuff or or swinging like swinging. Yeah. Whatever. Um, is there a, I mean, I guess there's no elaborate polyamory creed, but is there kind of a view among polyamorists as whether there kind of should be a deep, some kind of significant emotional connection to all of the mates? Yeah. I mean, they call it polyamory, not, uh, polyfuckery. Like the point is to have emotional connections with multiple people and to do that in a kind of respectful, open, honest way. Mm -hmm. So it often gets confused with casual dating. 
But to me, casual dating of the sort that people in their 20s tend to do, like the Tinder lifestyle, where you're dating multiple people, but you're not actually telling anybody, honestly, how many other people are you dating? How serious is it? Are you committed to them? That, to me, is unethical non-monogamy, mm -hmm. right? Polyamory is supposed to be something where you leave everybody kind of better than you found them. You, you, you try to maximize happiness. You try to make it a positive sum interaction with everyone. How often does that fail? In other words, things don't end well between two people. I think it fails about as often as you would expect from relationships in general. So like in, in monogamous world, right, there's sort of this ideal that people don't date at all and then they magically fall in love and they get married and then they have lifelong monogamy ever after. And we know damn well that doesn't actually happen. People kind of date around in a kind of impulsive, chaotic, unethical way throughout their teens and 20s. Mm -hmm. right? And then they finally form a pair bond that seems to work and try to live together, and that fails. Form another pair bond, that fails. Form another one, finally it works, you get married. And then you have a divorce rate that it's not actually 50%, it's more like 30% mm -hmm. if you get married you know, past your early 20s. But still, monogamy also fails. So if you compare ideal monogamy to actual polyamory, poly doesn't look very good. But if you compare apples to apples, I think it looks, it looks pretty good and also pretty fulfilling. And it's also, to me, kind of an amazing adventure. It's kind of a psychological adventure. I'll bet. <laughs> Any particular stories you want to tell? Well, I mean, on the jealousy front, for example, if you'd asked me, you know, six or seven years ago, could I ever handle being in an, op in an open relationship, given our evolved propensities for jealousy, I would have said absolutely not. This is only six or seven years ago, you said? Yeah. So you're yeah. a recent convert. I'm a pretty recent convert, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and I would have said that's impossible. Jealousy is too strong. There's no way to manage it mindfully. Um, it's impossible to overcome, particularly you know, at my age. I was then in my late 40s. So there's a very, very steep learning curve, which is difficult, heartbreaking, one of the hardest things I've ever done. But once you get past that learning curve and you're like, I've mastered my jealousy, it's hugely liberating and it's great. And but is it that simple? I, I would think yeah, it's a recurring challenge. It is a recurring challenge, but it's it's much less difficult than you might imagine at first. Um, but, it, I mean, it depends on what kind of person you are. I think it helps to be smart and open-minded and conscientious and have willpower and all that stuff. I'm sure willpower would help. The, um, I would also think it would, it would, the nature of the relationship would matter. I, I mean, you know, it's one thing if the person you're living with night and day uh, and investing a huge amount of emotional resources in is cheating on you. Um, it's another thing, if it's somebody, yeah, you like them, but I mean, you know, if they died, you wouldn't be in mourning for a month, and you see them once a month, you see them once a week, and you have great sex, and yeah, you like them. It's not, it's not purely, it's not hedonistic in the crudest sense, but, you know, I'd imagine somebody like that it wouldn't be so hard for me to get over je my jealousy, actually. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, that's got to be part of it, right? Is symmetry of expectation or something? I, I think it helps to do particular kinds of polyamory, like the kind of polyamory that I do with my girlfriend, Diana Fleischman. We have Who has also been really on the show, by the way. Yeah. I'm covering this from all angles, although I didn't actually discuss polyamory with yeah. her. I wanted to get the permission of her polyamorous mate before. I thought it was the, you know, the decent Fair thing enough. to do. Yeah, thank, yeah. You, thank you. Um, we have a really strong pair bond. You know, we've been dating for five years, long distance. And in a lot of ways, we're uniquely suited to each other in a way that makes us kind of irreplaceable. So that makes it easier to deal with jealousy because I'm like, 
if she's dating another guy, how can he possibly be as appealing uh, like, as me? It's not that he's going to have higher, like he might have higher mate value to most people, but he probably won't be an evolutionary psychology professor like Diana is. He probably won't be libertarian. He probably won't be into effective altruism. He probably won't be as good at polyamory as me. Like there's, there's about 10 things that kind of line up that make our pair bond kind of uniquely strong and, and pretty ironclad in terms of like, I'm not going to be very easily threatened by some other guy. And likewise, she's not going to be very easily threatened by some other woman. Yeah. But that's because you can say to her, she didn't mean a thing to me. But I guess you don't say that, huh? Well, I mean, no. But she's cause... thinking that. She's thinking that. In a way, you're both thinking that. It's just that according to stereotype of genders and according to, I think, evolutionary psychology, it's more reassuring for her to hear that naturally. For a woman to hear the guy say she didn't mean a thing to me than it is for the man to hear the woman say, he didn't mean a thing to me. If anything, it, that's almost more threatening to a man traditionally, right? Because it means, oh God, she'll just, you know, she'll sleep with anything. She doesn't even have to like the person. That Some men find that more threatening. Yeah, I think the key thing about polyamory compared to ordinary cheating is you're honest about your feelings. So if I'm dating another woman, I'm actually honest with my primary partner about what level of feeling I have, right? And we've been through multiple situations where I develop so-called new relationship energy, NRE, where you're <laughs> kind of falling for someone, right? I remember that. Yeah. I had it 31 that's, that's, years ago. It was great. It's great. Um, if you can admit, I've, you know, I have this NRE with this other woman, or she admits I have a little bit of NRE with some other guy, you can have a realistic expectation that, that's going to have a certain time course, right? And we will get through it. And it is not an existential threat to the relationship. So if you have a more realistic expectation that like, just because my partner has feelings about somebody else doesn't mean she's going to leave. It doesn't mean she's going to like overinterpret what that is and what it means in her life. I think that's the crucial thing. If you're a monogamist, right, and your partner says, I have feelings for somebody else, then you catastrophize it, right? Mm -hmm. you, 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 you reject any kind of mindful approach to it, and you go, this is terrible. This is the end of everything. I'm going to go into a deep depression. Like, if you're experienced poly, you don't have to do that. You can just say, good, okay, fine. That, like, I understand what she sees in that guy. He's kind of cool. I would like to meet him, make friends with him, and, and actually see, oh, he's not really a threat to me. Do you think it helps that Diana isn't in the same town with you as a rule? Because um, it seems more, because whatever she's doing seems more remote, right? It kind of seems remote, but I, I do tend to meet, like, everybody she dates, and, and she is Oh, man. She dates, oh, she dates I'm not sure I want to see this women. movie. Um, so uh, how, how does that work out? Um, pretty well in the sense that we actually can vet each other's mate choices to some degree, right? So if she meets a guy and I hear about him and I kind of look him up online and I go, he looks cool, he looks reliable, he looks trustworthy, that's great. If I vet him and I go, like, oh shit, he's, he's all over the, the, like the Manosphere Reddit forums and he's <laughs> talking smack about other guys. Then I might go, you should stay away from him. Right. Have and you, we don't, I, yeah. So it's a kind of, it's a kind of veto power. Have you, have you both exercised veto power? Yeah. Once in a while. Yeah. Uh huh. And I think that's the realistic way to do it because. Of, you know, I've studied mate choice for 30 years, but everybody's mate choice is fallible. Yeah. And I think having a partner who can kind of triangulate, you know, on a more accurate view of somebody can be really helpful. And you don't feel like there's no part of you going when you're about to give the green light. There's no part of you resisting that. Like, yeah, actually, I'd rather she not be sleeping with anybody, including this guy. There's um, a little bit of 
there's a little bit of that, but honestly, the way we try to schedule things is like if she's on a date, I'll try to make sure I'm on a date at more or less the same time, same weekend, whatever. Mm. So we try to keep a balance that way. We try to keep a balance of relative numbers of people we're involved in. Um, if there was a huge asymmetry there, right, that would be a lot more difficult. But the way we kind of run this is uh, we try to not make it exactly egalitarian, but 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 try to to yeah try to keep some kind of balance about who's doing what. Mm -hmm. Now, at some point, when you when you're talking about sex differences from the standpoint of evolutionary psychology, you should issue the standard disclaimer. We're talking about statistical generalizations about groups. There's variation within groups. I mean, both variations in the genes, but also, and perhaps more importantly, var variation in the behavioral expression of the genes and and even the psychological expression. You could say so. There's going to be a lot of diversity, and 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 some uh, people in both. Uh, genders are not going to conform to the norm very closely. I just wanted to say that at some point, but it's also a good um, lead in to this question. Do you find in your relationship with her? I mean, first of all, I'm assuming are you two, do you two seem to manifest the differences, roughly speaking, that an evolutionary psychologist would expect between a man and a woman, A, and B, does that show up and complicate things? I think both of us are a little bit weird in terms of sort of um, sex differences or gender roles, mm -hmm. right? So um, I have a very sort of masculine brain in the sense of being kind of aspy and very systematizing and very logical and rational and like not really very tuned into ordinary social cues. So in that sense, I'm quite masculinized. Um, she's quite masculinized in terms of like, being quite assertive, extroverted, um, and having more of a kind of masculine style sexuality than some women do. So we're both kind of a weird patchwork. And I think that helps us understand each other better. You know, I think it helps that we're, we're both in evolutionary psych. And I, I think it's important to note that, you know, there are a lot of people out there who would be very, very happy with lifelong monogamy. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, right? There's individual differences in how much sexual novelty you want, how easily bored you get, how strong a pair bond you like. And so it's exactly your point that these individual differences are big, they're meaningful, they shape our mate preferences, our mating strategies. And I think there's no one size fits all kind of relationship um, pattern. You know, one thing I like about monogamy is it's such a time saver. It's like if you just give up entirely on being appealing to other women, and I think I've succeeded there, by the way, and, and just just don't don't worry about it and don't, you know, and you're not, there's not any other relationship you're worrying about. I mean, obviously, you get married, you have kids. Kids can soak up a fair amount of your time. Uh, at the same time, let's leave kids out of the, the equation because you could have those in either case. But but just uh, comparing apples to apples, say a childless childless monogamous relationship versus polyamory, I got to think it eats up a lot of time because for one, you know, for one thing, once once it's a possibility, right? You think about it like I used to sit at like academic or conferences I'd go to, and I'd think, you know, if if I had ever at a conference like used it, you know, to hook up and succeed in hooking, then at every conference from then on, once it was a precedent and I had cheated on my wife and I did this at conferences, God, at every conference, I'd be spending all my time, right, figuring out how to get so and so to do such and such. And, and, uh, anyway, I guess I've said enough about how time consuming I think this is. Am I wrong? No, I think there's a lot of people who do poly as like that's their main hobby. That is their leisure activity. Yeah. Like they do poly instead of watching TV or, you know, building model ships or skiing or whatever. So you can, it can soak up as much time as you have and more. Um, particularly if you kind of enjoy the, the poly drama, right? Which is making it into a reality TV show. And and sort of having feelings all the time about everything and needing to process those feelings and wanting to talk about your relationships with everyone. 
And Diane and I found, find all of that stuff infinitely tedious and we hate it and we don't want to live our lives it, it sort of enmeshed in that, that kind of polydrama. Um, what we tend to do is find um, other people we see who are extremely low maintenance, right? Where they're like, I'm seeing this other person. That's my primary partner. I will see you every two months. We will not text very much in the meanwhile like maybe once a week um so it's not actually that big a time sink um and of course the other thing is you know i've i spent the first part of my career pointing out an awful lot of what people do is mating effort right they just don't admit it to themselves you mean any so, status any any status quest status is in effect seeking, mating right yeah. status seeking creative effort writing books i still do that you know, i just didn't realize doing, it was sexual activity i would enjoy well, it more if i had thought of it that way i didn't realize <laughs> it was sex that's a mistake i've been making writing is sex it's fun it's, yeah it's so it's not that we're doing some kind of machiavellian thing of like oh if i write this book i will get more mates but rather the creative impulse to show how awesome and creative and smart we are mm -hmm. Right, tended to cash out in prehistory in extra mates, and that's why we have those impulses. So a lot of people are running around kind of motivated by unconscious mating effort, but they're not actually kind of cashing it out in any way. Right. Um, and, and the thing is that their mates notice, right? Our mates are actually better at noticing when we're doing mating effort than we are often because we're self-deceived. In the sense that, what, you mean so? Like, wh oh, why, you, why do you want to go to that conference? Or why, why do you want to go on that you know, TV show? Why, why can't you just go to the grocery store or take care of our baby or whatever? Right. So everybody in, in, in a monogamous relationship with kids right, knows time is limited, energy is limited, kids take a lot of effort. So anything you put into kind of creative career display or, or, or creative leisure activities in a way is taking time away from your mate and your kids mm -hmm. anyway. That's true. And this actually gets at one of the asymmetries um, that evolutionary psychology has been known to note. You know, for a man, for a 50 or 60 year old man, um, say a 60 year old man, um, you know, further procreation is still possible. It's very unlikely to be the case for a 60 year old woman. So the way they're devoting their energies, uh, if the man is still totally absorbed in his career and the woman is, uh, totally devoted to the kids. I mean, these are both oversimplifications, but in a Darwinian sense, um, that stands to reason, even if the man isn't, um, converting the status into sex. Yeah, and I, you know, I think it's also important for people in poly to be realistic about the kid issue. Like, I've, I've raised a kid. I have a 20, 23 year old daughter. Um, as, you know, if and when Diane and I have kids, we will probably dial down our polyamory for a while while the kids are young because we're well aware that there's time trade offs. Mm -hmm. So I think people going into polyamory and thinking, I will be able to act once I have a, you know, three toddlers the way I act when I'm a 24 year old single person are, are delusional. Mm -hmm. um, now under certain conditions, you might be able to get help raising kids from your other partners if they happen to live in the same place. Um, and that would be nice. But, um, you know, the people who preach monogamy are correct in thinking, having kids is the big challenge and a mating system has to kind of wrap itself around that challenge mm -hmm. rather than vice versa. Mm -hmm. So um, we talked about the, um, the jealousy asymmetry that, that Ebb Psych posits, um, you know, both on theoretical grounds and with a certain amount of supporting evidence as well. Um, the, the, another big asymmetry, Ebb Psych asymmetry that I would think could create, complication is that you know men kind of famously are more again on average maybe um capable of pursuing sex and finding it attractive independent of a personal attraction to the person so this shows up 
just in the fact that pornography is overwhelmingly a male endeavor. Males are more aroused by sheerly visual cues. They don't have to know anything about the woman to uh, become attracted and so on. And I think this one thing, I, 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 don't, I, I don't know that I've heard this accusation about polyamory, but, it, but, but I, I've sort of wondered about it in the context of just the hookup culture, right? Like, is this, is this not kind of a plot sponsored by males to arrange to have impersonal sex, even though, in fact, that's going to be more gratifying more often for them than it is for women, and women, more often than men, are going to start out with something that they thought might be relatively impersonal sex, find themselves more emotionally involved, and then find uh, that the emotional involvement is not reciprocated and feel burned. I, I, I wondered that about the hookup culture. I wonder that about this. In any event, as an evolutionary psychologist, you can certainly imagine, I guess, how a person could construct this theory, that this is like a bunch of alpha males. And yeah, they profess to say, you should always have an emotional commitment to everyone. Um, I yeah. mean, if I had a dollar for every untrue thing that a man has professed to a woman in the course of, of arranging to have sex, uh, you know, so what's your, what's your reaction to that? I think if you just want to be, a, you know, a self-described alpha male who adopts a kind of exploitative short-term mating strategy and maximize the number of women you sleep with, polyamory is a terrible way to do that right? You should just do casual dating and Tinder hookup culture and, you know, move to New York or some other big city where it's easy to do that strategy because there's an advantageous sex ratio and um, kind of do that and don't make a pretense of having multiple ongoing emotionally meaningful relationships that are characterized by radical honesty and openness, right? That, that is way too much work. But, for these, well, but uh, actually, isn't it the case, I'm, I'm, this is sheer conjecture, that in hookup culture, in Tinder culture, whatever, there is a certain amount of males professing to be exaggerating their level of emotional commitment, which takes work, and if you're at all conscientious, involves guilt, um, yeah, right? Yeah. So, so it's not like those cultures are devoid of, it's not like the problem is erased there, right? Yeah, it doesn't erase the problem that uh, men will will lie and cheat and you know exaggerate commitment, and that women will have commitment skepticism and be like, "Do you really mean that?" And like, "Why didn't you get back to me when I texted you last night?" Etc. Right? All of those dynamics are still going on. It's just um, the the sort of lack of integrity and lack of ethics in that kind of hookup culture really bugs me. Mm -hmm. And, and it's kind of morally disgusting to me and the people in, you know, the manosphere or red pill land or the pickup artists who kind of advocate that approach to mating. Um, I almost think of it as like the opposite of polyamory because it really takes a very predatory view towards women. And I'm I'm just not comfortable with that view. Maybe, maybe those guys have different mate preferences. I'm pretty sapiosexual. I'm really only attracted to women who I find kind of intellectually interesting. And so I'm not just out there in the, the, the bars and clubs trying to hook up with whoever is cute. Um, that's, that's not me. I think actually some of the men doing that have the same philosophy as you do. It's just easier for them to find a woman they consider as intelligent as them. <laughs> but, but, but I, I honestly, I don't think, I mean, if you read the way that the pickup artist guys yeah. write about, I've never, they, I've never gotten into that literature. Here's a question though. What's the difference between those books and the book you co-authored, which is called mate colon become the man women want. The key difference um, is we basically advocate young men need to understand what women want and try to turn themselves into men who exemplify those positive traits, right? Rather than adopting a kind of Machiavellian exploitative view that says, if you just identify like these hot buttons to push and these little dating hacks, then, you know, 
you'll achieve success. What Tucker and I were advocating was a much deeper game where you have to actually do the self-improvement to become the man that women want. And that involves everything from, you know, good diet and exercise to working on your social skills, to working on your career, to working on your sense of humor or cultivating your artistic and musical talents and, and, um, and also figuring out how to do the kind of proof of, of romance, love and commitment and relationships that women crave. So it sounds a little Jordan Peterson ish, just in the sense that it's like you got to do the work kind of self help as opposed to you got to love yourself more. Yeah. I think if people read Peterson's, you know, 12 rules for life and they read the mate book, they'll see a lot of overlap in the kind of approach that we take. Um, and we also emphasize that ideal relationships between men and women can be very positive some. And that the, the kind of typical manosphere approach has this horrible battle of the sexes, zero sum mentality. That's basically, well, if, if, if I'm not getting what I want from a woman, then she must be exploiting me in some way. Mm -hmm. As opposed and to I, reflecting my own inadequacy in some sense. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, on the contrary, mature men and women can have amazing positive sum relationships where they both get like 80% of what they want and have to compromise a little bit. But if, if you run your relationship intelligently, it can be awesome. Um, so th this issue, though, of men, I mean, here's a related point to this, this, uh, to, to something I just said. So I've also thought, I mean, when I said that, that I've suspected that in hookup culture, there is a certain amount of male exploitation of women. And I'm sure there's different kinds of female exploitation of males that assumes different forms, but where there's more of a profession of emotional commitment, even though nominally, you know, the idea of hookup culture is there doesn't have to be much emotional commitment and so on, I guess. And uh, th that there is, uh, sometimes faults profession by the male of emotional commitment. And sometimes the male doesn't even really know it. I mean, I think men are, men are good at deceiving themselves. People in general are good at deceiving themselves in order to deceive others. Um, but I've also thought, uh, this is a question for an evolutionary psychologist, that sometimes males who vigorously deny the, uh, the EVSight claim of any asymmetry in the sexual psychology of the two sexes, are are actually using that denial in an exploitative way. In other words, the deal is like, oh, well, who would have guessed that in the end she was more interested in me than I was in her? I mean, after all, men and women are the same, so I certainly couldn't have guessed that it would be that, right? right? I mean, I yeah. see this, uh, I think I see this all the time. And actually, I don't, but I think I suspect it all the time. Yeah, I think that happens a lot. and And I think it's why... A lot of women have learned not to trust men who, who describe themselves as sort of Sensitive. gender feminist mm -hmm. or social justice activists, right? Because they're often try, kind of trying to slip in under the radar of saying, I'm just like you. There's no sex differences. We're all just blank slates. I'm trying to overcome my sexual programming just like you're overcoming your sexual programming. And then they have a relationship and it unfolds according to standard Darwinian, you know, expectations and one or both of them get really hurt. And it's terrible. I would much rather live in a world where men and women are kind of radically honest about their similarities and differences, and they kind of learn to, to manage them intelligently. I, I want to emphasize, I mean, it certainly happens that men are smitten by women, the love is not reciprocated, and the men are crushed. It even happens after they've had casual sex. It ha all these things happen. So I, I don't want to act as if I'm, I'm uh, oversimplifying the, the expectations. But I do think in the aggregate, statistically, very common dynamic is the, the first one I described. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, guys who are experienced with polyamory do have to learn to manage women's emotional expectations, just like women in polyamory have to learn to manage men's sexual expectations. So for me, for example, if I have a secondary partner who I see once in a while, right, I have to trust 
that she is going to be honest with me about how much emotional commitment and romance and professions of love she wants. And I'm going to have to be very careful about not kind of over promising and making sure that I kind of calibrate her expectations appropriately. And that's a tough skill to learn. I'm still kind of learning it, but I think guys who do master that and can actually be honest with women about, look, I really like you. I feel some love for you, but this is like, you're not the one, you're not going to be my primary partner. Um, that's a lot better ethically, right? Than getting into this thing of kind of over promising and over committing and writing love songs and then not following through and breaking someone's heart. But, but I assume you do see in the polyamory culture, Men who are doing the thing I suspect men of sometimes doing, even even possibly without even realizing it, but but I'm sure the the problem arises even there, right? Oh yeah. And polyculture tends to be pretty close knit. So there's a lot of um gossip and sharing of information about people's reputations. How good are they at poly? How good are they at managing jealousy? How good are they at managing new relationship energy and not getting carried away and not, you know, giving signals of commitment that they don't follow through on. So we actually share information about that. And, um, and it's good because reputation is a really valuable thing, as you know, in, in a social primate. Yeah. Um, so, and are there, I mean, is it kind of a small enough community that in a given city that's big enough to have a, a, a discernible polyculture at all, kind of everyone knows everyone unless it's like New York city or something. I mean, yeah, there's sort of different layers. Like there's the people who actually go to the poly meetup groups and are sort of out and public. They tend to be in their twenties. They tend to be um, not necessarily in professions where they would suffer much stigma. Um, and then there's the people who are kind of more mature and they're sort of poly on the down low and they're not going into public meetup groups, but they do kind of know who in my little city is sort of like-minded. Um, in big cities though, it's totally different. Like New York has tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people who would, you know, identify as polyamorous. And of course they don't all know each other. But in any given neighborhood, they might know quite a few people. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, is there a – so there's not like a problem with being an aging polyamorous. And I don't mean in the practical sense it's harder to find people attracted to you. What I mean is um, one, of the, one of the virtues of lifelong monob monogamy, I think, is that as you get older and need the support more, like you're going to be getting sick more. And, you know, I wouldn't say you're there. Uh, I hope I'm not really quite there. I don't feel like I'm getting sick a lot. But, um, but you know, more and more you need support until the very end, you know, when you die. It's also a virtue of having kids. But is there, do you observe, is it disgust or anything that like, uh, well, things were so fluid. They were fun while they lasted. But now they were so fluid that I have a lot of people I can kind of count on a little, but nobody I can count on a lot. Yeah. Well, I think this is why, you know, my, my point of view basically is like pair bonds are essential. Long-term pair bonds are absolutely central to human evolution. Most children in prehistory were raised by long-term pair bonded couples. Um, and I think pair bonds are really good if you're getting older and sicker and you need help and you need somebody you can rely on. So, I'm in a serious long-term committed pair bond. Diana is. We have that understanding. We hope it'll last for decades or however long we last. The question is, around the margins, do you have a pair bond that's sexually exclusive, where monogamy is the expectation, or do you have a pair bond that's slightly open and sort of monogamish, where maybe you see other people like once in a while, but it's pretty rare, or do you have a pair bond that's an open relationship? Or do you have a pair bond that's polyamorous, but this is the primary mm -hmm. bond? And like you have other, you have secondary partners. 
So there's a whole spectrum, but I think we could probably agree, and I think most evolutionary psychologists would agree, the pair bond is the central thing. It's just a question of how do you manage other relationships, if at all. Is there a, um, a sex ratio problem in the sense that there are more men interested in being in this community than women? And so you find uh, the according kind of competitive dynamic that you, you might think that you might think that but in fact what you you tend to see is well there's more men trying to do casual dating and more women who want kind of long-term boyfriend so there's a huge mismatch in the sort of dating culture like the tender mm -hmm. culture and that's where you see those horrifying stats like 80 percent of women are competing for like the top 20 percent of men Mm -hmm. In poly community, it's kind of surprising, but it seems to be about a 50-50 sex ratio. And I think the issue is it takes a certain kind of guy who can actually master his, his jealousy well enough that he can manage an open relationship, right? A lot of guys have this double standard that's like, I would love to be promiscuous, but if I had a girlfriend, I would not be able to countenance her seeing anybody else. So polyamory will not be very attractive to those guys. Okay, so I just saw a stat. I think you saw it too. I, I think I saw you comment on it on Twitter. Um, the number of men who have not had sex within the last year has risen. It was a number for men between 18 and 30, and I forget how high it had gotten, but it was surprisingly high. I was over, what was it, 22% or something? But the point is, it had risen sharply over 10 years or something. The, the number of women who fit that description was lower and I think had remained pretty stable. I guess I can infer from what you're saying about there being the sex ratio being pretty balanced in polyculture, that polyculture is not contributing to that problem. I mean, th th that, that business of kind of sexually disenfranchised males is classically a reflection of, you know, polygamy or, you know, polygyny where some men are uh, dominating uh, a large number of well dominate i don't i guess i have to be careful uh, about my language in terms of who who i'm going to get into trouble with about what but um some some men have are, are having sex with a number of women on a regular basis some men are having sex with none the women are having there are a lot of women having sex if you do the math but but some men are shut out of the the kind of uh Sweepstakes, and uh, historically, this is sometimes a political problem. Uh, some people think it's the reason that you see authoritarianism associated with polygamy, because if you have a highly polygamous society, a lot of sexually disenfranchised males, you're going to have to have firm rule to keep them under control. This book by Laura Betzig, you may remember, Despotism and Differential Reproduction. Um, so uh, where was I going with that question? I, I, so I guess what you would say is tender culture may be contributing to that problem. Because in tender culture, maybe a relatively small number of males are having a disproportionate amount of mating success, sexual success. But you're saying it's not the case in polyculture. No, I, I think this is a fundamental issue that a lot of people get wrong, is confusing polyamory with polygyny, right? So in a polygyny culture where, you know, a few males are accounting for a lot of mating with a lot of females, um, or a polygamy culture where just, you know, one male is marrying multiple females or it's Genghis Khan with his harem or whatever. It's, it's Bronze Age, you know, Celtic warlords with their harems. Those are the situations where you get a bunch of sexually disenfranchised males at the bottom who can't find any mates. And you get maximum inequality of mating success between males. And that is very miserable for a lot of people. Right? It's miserable to the males who can't get a girlfriend. It's kind of miserable to a lot of the women who have to share a high-status guy who's often pretty neglectful and domineering towards them. Um, it's not good for the kids because the kids aren't getting paternal investment from you know, a male. They're getting part of a high-status male. So advocating for polyamory is not advocating for that kind of polygyny. If you really are concerned about the lower status males having some access 
to women, then you should be concerned about allowing women to have their sexual sovereignty and their freedom to date multiple males. That'll solve the problem. If more women... In other words, you should want that to happen, not that you should be worried that it will right. happen. When you say... Concern. Right. You should want it to happen. Like, look, if I was in, you know, the Chinese Communist Party Politburo, and I was worried about the fact that there are tens of millions of young males in China who can't find a girlfriend, um, there are multiple ways to deal with that. But I think nudging Chinese culture to be a little more polyamorous and to teach guys how to manage their sexual jealousy a little bit better so that those guys have at least a chance of being a secondary partner to a woman who maybe already has a primary. That's the way to solve it, right? Not imposing monogamy when there just aren't enough women to go around. That's not going to work. Okay. Um, and I know this is a tricky argument, and it's it'll be very confusing to a lot of listeners. Yeah, the the um, no people don't think a lot about about these issues. Um, the um, so we we mentioned Jordan Peterson. You made a reference to social justice warriors that wasn't altogether in in a not altogether flattering context, perhaps. I have a question for you. Are you do, do you consider yourself a member of the intellectual dark web? I, I kind of think of you that way just by virtue of your pattern of association, but is that wrong? Yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't disavow the IDW. Sure. And what, I, I guess people mostly know what that is. If not, they can um, Google the Barry Weiss uh, piece on IDW, there's this whole question. They, they, they purport to not be ideological. I don't want to get too political here. They purport to not be ideological. The critique from the left is that they are, in fact, ideological, more right-wing than left. But but the question um, the question I have is, do you get – we mentioned that you don't uh, – that, 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 that polyamory is not always well-received by your ev-psych friends just because they don't see it working. Um, what about IDW people? I think reactions are mixed. I would love to have more discussion in IDW about different mating systems and what is actually going to be helpful and realistic for the 21st century. Because I think a lot of IDW people are kind of quite monogamous, but I don't think they've really thought through like why they are, quite how it articulates with their, you know, a lot of IDW people are quite evolutionary in their orientation. And they accept the biology, they accept sex differences, they think hard about mating systems and marriage and pronatalism and, you know, the future of the gene pool and civilization and so forth. Um, but I think when it comes to alternative mating patterns, we need a, a much more serious and well-informed discussion about that. Because if we don't, then you're going to see the same horrible partisan split like where everybody on the far left is sort of advocating polyamory and all the polyamorous are on the far left and everybody who's sort of a intellectually serious centrist like i think a lot of the idw people are end up being kind of reactively monogamous right and they think oh poly is just what those crazy social justice people do and largely they're true, but I, I think there's a I think there's a better way forward. So you're saying most polyamorous are on the left and are laboring on what you consider a mistaken view of human nature. Yes. And um and so I guess you you correspondingly, given your emphasis on understanding human nature to be a, 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 a I guess an a, an upstanding and <laughs> uh polyamorous, you think that polyamory is being done badly a whole lot. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think it's being done badly and and you know, to cut it some slack, um it's only been around for 30 years, right? Whereas monogamous marriage has been around for thousands of years. So, culture has invented lots of amazing rituals and norms and rules and hacks for making monogamous marriage work well given our human nature. Mm -hmm. Whereas polyamory hasn't got that stockpile of kind of cultural innovations yet. 
that let us be as good at poly as like monogamous married people are at marriage. Does that make sense? So, yeah, I mean, of course, the book Open Marriage came out probably more like 50 years ago. And, and that was part of the round of, I guess, hippie communes, which, you know, had something in common with this. But I take your point that this you're, you're saying this is truly a distinct phase in the evolution of of, um, you know, multiple sexual relationships under conditions of transparency. This is a different version, you're saying. Yeah, it's it's new, and I think we have to be, you know, honest and open and say it's new, it's experimental. Um, we don't know how well polyamory will work long term for a lot of people. For some some people, have been in open or poly relationships for decades, and it works really well for them. But I think it would be totally premature to say, "Oh, this could become the default mating system for most people." Yeah. Maybe it, maybe it won't. I don't think it ever would have worked for me, but um, and I'm certainly glad that uh, uh, I don't have right now the time suck that I would think it could turn into. But 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 I think I've given it a fair hearing. Is there any is there anything else you want to say about it? I guess I would just emphasize the ethics of it. You know, like I know a lot of libertarians, and I am a libertarian, who think freedom is a good thing. And allowing people to come together and enjoy gains from trade and have the freedom to interact with multiple buyers and sellers in a free market is excellent and it maximizes value and it produces innovations and it's, mm-hmm. that's all good. But then when it comes to the sexual domain, right, a lot of libertarians go totally anti libertarian. They're like, oh, sexual freedom is bad. Freedom in marriage would be bad. Sexual sovereignty, where you can actually negotiate relationships with more than one person, Mm -hmm. is bad. And that's a weird double standard to me. Well, but of course, even many libertarians would say that in the sheerly economic realm, when there are negative externalities, in other words, the, you know, the, the, the people making individual choices in markets leads to things that are bad kind of in an overarching way, like pollution, a classic example, you let them buy whatever they want, put whatever they want in their car, creates pollution that's bad for everybody. A lot of libertarians will say, okay, there, there are grounds for regulation and departing for, from a pure free market model. And I think a lot of them would say uh, that, you know, if, if you, if you just let uh, whatever is going to happen, happen on the sexual front, you will wind up with kids growing up without, uh, you know, adequate investment. You may wind up with disin- sexually disenfranchised males starting revolutions. There's any number of arguments they could make. Now, I understand you think that they're mistaken to think that those all would apply to what you're espousing, but but I don't think it's inherently contradictory for a libertarian to make an argument for a conservative sexual morality. Oh, yeah. Externalities are real and important and worth regulating. Absolutely. But the history of sexual ideology suggests an awful lot of claims that, oh, this mating pattern will have all these negative externalities on everybody else. Time and time and time again, those claims prove to have been overblown, right? Like with gay marriage, there are a lot of conservatives saying, if you undermine the one one man, one woman policy, civilization will collapse, right? You can't possibly have monogamy that, that is homosexual. Um, the externalities will be too, too big, too, too dire. And lo and behold, you know, gay and lesbian people get married and it's fine and it doesn't really affect anything. It doesn't increase the percentage of people who are gay or lesbian. It, it, the sky hasn't fallen. And you see the same with debates about sex work, with porn, with um, premarital sex. You saw the same arguments with allowing no like divorce, etc. Now, some of those, like no fault divorce, um, actually do I think have more negative externalities than polyamory is likely to have. But we've we've sort of just sucked it up and dealt with it somehow. 
Yeah, I mean, I think the one the one case where I haven't seen a lot of successful versions of this is is polygamy. I, I mean, I mean, it seems to me there's always a big downside to point to, and that is the prevailing model. And I don't think, and, and in some respects, polygyny, which I know you're saying uh, poly is not, but classic polygyny, where uh, just, you know, it's not an official matter of a man being married to a lot of women, but some men are having relations with a whole lot of women and some men are getting no women. That has some of the downsides of polygamy. So I, I don't think, I don't think, again, I don't, I don't think the libertarian concern is crazy. Maybe you have, uh, satisfactory responses. I, I, I don't, um, but I don't think they're, they're just like kind of deeply misguided and confused. No, I think, um, and, and I should add, we're not necessarily talking about legal regulation. I mean, gay marriage did involve that, but in some cases, we're talking about normative regulation. That, that you know, why they might argue that we just normatively discourage an extreme version of the hookup culture, for example. Yeah, I, I think okay. Number one, polygyny is bad for all the reasons that, like Jordan Peterson or Brett Weinstein, would would probably agree. Um, to me, it's bad mostly because it imposes one, you know, alpha despot's sexual proprietariness and ownership on multiple women, and it doesn't give them the sexual freedom to have other mates. To me, that's the fundamental ethical problem with it. Well, with polygamy, not polygyny, right? Not well. Actually, with either, because usually polygyny does not involve the males making an effort to control okay. their sexual jealousy. Okay, right. We, we should say that, I guess, strictly speaking, the definition of polygyny is just great variation among the sexual uh, success of males, right? Some are getting yeah. a, lot, a lot of sex with, with a lot of partners, and some are getting none with any. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I think it's also worth having a discussion about the um, ethical problems with casual dating culture which I think are really serious and I think yeah. are causing huge problems and misery and anxiety and depression. Um, and I think polyamory isn't part of that. Polyamory might be a partial answer to that problem. Um, so I think a lot of what happens on Tinder is ethically terrible and harmful and exploitative and traumatic. And the sexes don't have good norms and rules and expectations about how any of that plays out. And I think it's totally fine for, you know, grown adults to have a discussion about maybe that's not the ideal way for people in their teens and twenties to interact with each other sexually. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? No, nope, that's a totally, totally covered all of Polly. Okay, all, all of uh, all you need to know about Polly. Um, all right, well, thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, anything you want to plug? Um, your Twitter handle again is Primal Polly. Mine is Robert Writer. That's W R I G H T E R. Any uh, recent uh, things you've written or anything you want to point website you want to point to or anything? Oh, I've got a couple of pieces in Quillette, the online magazine. The, 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 um, the magazine of the IDW, is it not, in effect? More or less, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And uh, I'm working on a book about the future of mating patterns, but it won't be out for a year or two, at least. Okay, well, we're starting to build up buzz right now. Yeah. It begins now. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Jeffrey. Thanks, Robert.